about home They're married to really stay Well, welcome everybody and welcome to our wonderful 41st episode of Married to Real Estate. Wow, how fast it goes, baby. It does. It does. does. We're going to have fun today, Mary. Yes, I'm so excited. So wait till you hear what you're going to hear. My goodness. So Mary, tell us what's going on with life. Well, I have um, a story to tell you that um, is a little out of the ordinary. I was um, out of the office last week, just life in general and business. But um, I was in on Monday and I heard this blah, blah, noise out my window. I'm on the third floor. And um, so I look out and I see a lady lying on the, the cement in front of one of our buildings, you know, that's next right. door. So I run down three flights of stairs in my heels, not a runner, <laughs> certainly not in the right shoes, run over there, and I'm like, are you all right? She couldn't get up. She yeah. thought she broke her arm. I called 911, fire, you know, ambulance, police came. Um, so, you know, I really felt fortunate. No one else came from any of the other buildings. So wow. it was like one of those things that was meant to be. I was in the right place at the right time. Her name is Joanne, and I hope that she's all right. They took her to the hospital. Good. Um, so I hope she's going to be okay. Good. Thank um, you for your for your yeah. general, your kindness and your service to others, as always. It was a little surreal. Like, do you need help? Of course you need yeah. help. Like, it was, you know, just one of those things. But I think, you know, you just bring into action when you see it. When you're called upon. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, I had a closing, and um, I have a new listing coming on next week, and um, I got a buyer's offer accepted, which is always oh. a celebration in the seller's market. So, yeah. We've had a seller's market a long time. Long time. I was talking to my personal financial planner the other day in Northern Virginia because we lived there forever, you know. And uh, so I said, what's new? And he said, I got, I won a bid for a house. I thought, <laughs> you won a bid? He said, you don't know how, how long I've been trying to get yeah. a house for my expensive family. So, yeah. so it's a very strange time. I know from your perspective to our guests, but also very much from this end. Well, right. I, I've been what very busy, yes, very yes. busy with Rotary. We have so many activities going on and so many amazing activities, such as we had guests, Rotarians from Sweden. And oh. that was really lovely. We took them up the Merrimack River on the clean river boat, pontoon boat. And that was just one of the things that we've been doing lately. Neat. We've been having a blast. Just now, a blast. are you still the president? Until June 30th, and then I'm done. Okay. Well, <laughs> so, just done with leading. Get um, done with Rotary leading. With <laughs> you know it is. You know, you know how it is. Yes. 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 So today, we are going to talk about the birds and the bees. I'm so excited. <laughs> yes. How long has it been since you talked about the birds and oh, the bees? Oh, gosh. Yeah. What was I? In fourth grade? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the biggest surprises I had by moving to Chelmsford to this big piece of land that we acquired was there were bird boxes in the next yard and bird boxes in the next yard and none in ours. Oh. And I found out why. But every day in the spring, this car would pull up in front of my house and this lady would get out of the car and walk to these bird boxes and she would open them up or listen and she would make notes and she would go back to her car. Oh, okay. So that is our guest today, oh. Giancarla Kalpas. And Giancarla, we are so happy to have you here Thank with you us very today. Much for the invitation. <laughs> so tell us about the birds and the bees. Anything you want to. Let's start with the birds. How about that? So um I maybe I'll start saying that I'm passionate about nature. Unfortunately, we have destroyed a lot of it and mm. destroyed habitat. And so we have lost species of plants and, and pollinators and birds because of this destruction of the natural world. So the first time I got involved, I decided to do something about it when I found out that the eastern bluebird that once used to be a common bird in, in this area had become I don't want to say extinct, but locally extinct or rare. And I found out that the way to help them was to um, replace the natural cavities that in the old days they used to live in, like a, in an abandoned woodpecker nest hole in a tree. Mm. And um, if you put up birdhouses and then monitor them regularly and, and help them, um, the bluebirds would come back. And so I first started in my own backyard, and it took a few years for, before the, 
they actually came, but in 1992, it, I think it was April 28th. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> birth of was, a child. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, we, we saw a bluebird in our yard, and he was checking the birdhouse, and yes, they did build a nest, and they had eggs and babies, and, and that was the beginning of the 30-plus years of my be monitoring uh, a bluebird. But see, my yard was not enough. I saw people had put up birdhouses in other locations, and so I volunteered to do the monitoring, because monitoring is essential for the success. And so at this point, I monitor over 100 birdhouses oh, wow. in many different uh, private you know, people's yards, like Mary said, her neighbor's yards and some of the town land. Uh, and so as of today, I have, um, well, so besides the bluebirds, there are other native birds that, that use the boxes, and the other species that I, that comes is the uh, tree swallows. So as of this morning, I have close to 30 tree swallows nests with eggs and close to 20 bluebird nests nests with either eggs or babies. Lovely. Oh, wow. Lovely. So one person really can make a difference. Well, that is what I told myself. You know, I cannot <clears throat> solve the big problems of the world, but I can do something in my own little sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. So the reason why you don't have birdhouses, mm -hmm. Mary, <clears throat> when it started, I, the lady who lived, you know, Mrs. House. Mrs. House, Mrs. yes. Mrs. Harriet House bought the birdhouses. And um, and then I also put up the birdhouses on on your left side of you, looking from the street. But then when she uh, when Mrs. House di died, the next owner was not interested in birdhouses. Mm. He contacted me and he said, "Remove them as quick, remove them immediately." He was afraid. He was mm. kind of a fearful <coughs> guy. He had a big fence. He put up a big fence. Yes. Yes. Well, the thing is that. Um, the bluebird, not so much, but the tree swallows, they will dive bomb you when you get near their house. They're protecting. Uh, in fact, sometimes I can hear the, the, the air, you know, the movement of the air where they flap their wings to, to get you away. Of course, I, I'm not harming them. I, I'm only opening the house to see if, if, if there is a nest, if are there eggs, did they hatch? I keep records. Um, so maybe, so I did remove the bird houses. And I asked your neighbor on the other side if they would allow us to put them there. And of course, they said yes. Of course. Now, the reason, <clears throat> the, the reason we d I didn't offer or didn't ask you to put houses on your backyard is that the bluebirds are territorial. They will not allow another pair of bluebirds within, say, the length of a um, football field. Oh. So the distance between <coughs> your two neighbors would allow me in fact, would allow two pairs, one here and one there, but then, in the middle. Not in my yard, it, yeah. Yes, but you can still enjoy the birds. They came on the suets. We put suet up this winter. Yes. I had bluebirds all winter. Oh, so that's all right. A I lot of other visit. beautiful birds. But yes. the tree swallows, they dive bomb me. When yes. I when I mow, you know, and now yes. I've gotten used to them. And but they're beautiful. Also. You can wear a hard hat. <laughs> <laughs> she has other plans for my hair for them to grab onto either Mary. So <laughs> we're gonna hear about the bees pretty soon okay. too. <laughs> yes. So the the project of of helping the bluebirds and and the other native birds uh, has been successful. So when I found out about the problems with uh, native pollinators being in decline. Um, I wanted to take action about that, too, because I knew that I could help with something. I said, well, maybe I can help with this other problem. Right, you have a proven track record. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what I found out it, if, is that of the 12 bumblebees that used to be common in Massachusetts, two species have already been lost. Oh, wow. In the last couple of decades, mm -hmm. the scientists are telling us. Mm -hmm. And then there are three other species that are on the way to becoming locally extinct. So... Mm -hmm. Um, and I learned what to do to, to help. So what, what do you do? So you need to uh, plant the right plants that these um, bumblebees and other native bees need. They need plants for pollen and for nectar mm -hmm. for the whole season. They collect pollen to feed their larvae, their young ones, and they need nectar for themselves to eat every day. So you need to have a constant supply of pollen and nectar. But they have to be specific plants that they have co-evolved with throughout thousands and millions of years. They have their preferences. Like I do. 
Yeah, they are picky <laughs> eaters. So, <coughs> and some plants <laughs> give a better quality pollen on, or nectar. And the other one, the other part of it is that butterflies also need our help because most of the butterflies have um, specific needs. Like they, they lay their eggs only on a specific species. Mm. Oh, wow. Like we, you probably heard about the monarch butterflies mm-hmm. that will only lay eggs on milkweed. Oh. Um, because of those, cu- again, they have co-evolved the plants and, oh, sorry, the hands. I just did it all. The <laughs> no, 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 I've been doing yeah, this. That's all right. It's a free for all now. <laughs> to our audience, if we hit these, it makes lots yeah, of noises. Bang on the table, so don't worry about it. Bang. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Jeff did. You know? <laughs> so, and so it's not only the monarch. Uh, there are many other butterfly species that only lay eggs on certain plants. And so if they cannot find the plants, they will not lay the eggs. And so they will not be the next generation of the butterflies. That's the birds so, and the bees part. You so know. the yes. birds and the bees. So mm-hmm. um, so that is the idea. There are scientists who are, who are studying these relationships and, and they're telling us which are the plants that are needed. These, of course, are native plants, but not any native plants. Specifically, we want to plant those that help the species at risk. And are those plants easy to find or harder to find? Um Things are changing, so yes and no. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say that the scientist that is giving us the, the information and the, and the research is Dr. G. Gear, who's a professor at UMass Dartmouth. Um, and um, yes, the plants could be hard to find, but and you may have to drive in different directions, different nurseries. You also have to be very careful that when you buy plants, don't just get, you know, spur of the moment, uh, buy something that looks pretty. It ha- because it may look pretty to you, but it may not have the resources that are needed. No by, appeal by the, to the yes, animals. Yes, yeah. impulse buy. Yeah. Don't do impulse buying. Take your, print your list out from the website, the, the Becology website, and, and then go shopping with the list and be very specific. Do, and also don't buy, you may find something that looks like the right plant, but if it has an extra name, in single quotation, that is a cultivar. It's not a straight species. Ah, okay. So, so they won't we, like we it. just have to be so careful when we go shopping for plants. But sounds but, like there are information sources available. Yes. Right. Yeah, and yes, I belong to the Bumblebee Project, which is uh, sponsored by the Sudbury Valley Trustees. And, and there, there is a lot of information that linked to the plant list and, mm-hmm. and where to buy the plants. But you can also go directly to Dr. Gigia's website. If you, if you Google Dr. Gigia's plant list, you'll find it there. G-E-G-E-A-R. G-E-A-R. G-E-A-R. Yes. 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 Okay. And he's coming tomorrow to speak in Littleton, but maybe it, it will be too late to to find ah. what time yeah um, and we're doing the parade in the morning we are, we're doing the apple blossom parade yeah, so once again. when are you going to speak in littleton i'm not speaking dr jigia will be giving his talk at 10 a.m mm. in, at oh. the littleton parade li- time library yeah too many things maybe to they do. record it maybe the library will record it yeah but, maybe they will uh, I'll but call there over. are but there are other recordings of his um, available yeah, of on, mm. on youtube yeah. you did a lovely job the other night Thank for you. the chelmsford conservation land trust right yes mm-hmm. and they invited it was, me as a speaker it was wonderful yeah thank you it was really but good. if i can say something more about the plants when it, when we first put the plant it took a lot of driving in different directions to find the right plants but then the plants if they're pollinated they produce seeds that is what it means pollination right mm-hmm. that, the male and female part of the plant. <laughs> That's the part that I like, that yes. Is where it comes. <laughs> the plants need a matchmaker because the boys and the girls cannot walk to each other. So right. the pollinator makes the transfer of the pollen to the to the female part of the of the flower. And so if they're pollinated, they produce seeds. So you could collect seeds, and there are rules for collecting seeds. Don't take all of them. Take about 10%, leave some for the birds to eat and other animals to eat. So you harvest and seeds in your, your garden, right? Yes. Um, harvest the seeds and then clean. They have to be cleaned. Um, and then you can do, you can propagate them yourself. Hmm. Um, it's, there's a way of doing it called winter sow, where you, you plant in milk jugs and you make little greenhouses you, and you put them outside in the in the snow and the ice in the winter time and um, oh. It's called stratification. It's a natural way that seeds germinate with, 
alternating cold and, and the thawing uh, episodes throughout wow. the winter. So that is an in in expensive way of getting um, more plants. I mean, you can uh, harvest your own seeds or you can purchase seeds also. Do you sell seeds from your garden? No, I don't sell them. I, I give Just them away. away. Okay, good. Um, Excellent. So, tell us about your your how you're acquiring land. I've noticed that you are very talented. <laughs> <laughs> so when I decided to do this, um, the the part of the program that that I'm following with the bumblebee project is to put up, plant these plants, but not just in your own hidden yard. You know to to do it in a public uh, place where it becomes a public display, pollination preservation garden. And mm. so people, you know, they'll walk by, they'll get curious, and they, they will learn about what we're doing. Um, and so I, I, I was familiar with the Sunny Meadow Farm because that's where I have some of the bluebird boxes and where I have a little plot in the community gardens. And there, were some, there was some land there that was not used for a while looked abandoned so I was <laughs> I said I asked the person in charge of the activities I said well can I have this little square of land for a uh, pollination garden and he said oh sure he was happy that the place <laughs> was getting cleaned up right. but then there were more and more places that um, seemed not well taken care of and I kept <laughs> asking and he kept saying yes so at this point I have like five different plots very um, good. Yes. And are they together? Have you been able to string them together? The plots? Well, they're next to each other, but they are all in separate enclosures. I see. Uh, we, yeah, it would have been easier to make just one bigger, you know, one big enclosure and would have taken even less um, fencing material. Mm -hmm. But that is how it, because it didn't start planned that <laughs> way from the beginning. It, it kept expanding. Right. <laughs> Well, I but, was so enthused when you were speaking, just so enthused. But I'm thinking at 73 years old, how am I going to do this in that back 40 that we have? <laughs> but I'll call Giancarla and she'll, right. she'll give us some advice. Are some of these plants, are they hard to grow? What if you don't have a green thumb? Um, I always worry about that. Well, um, some are easier than others. Some are more picky um, as far as what, what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the plant list will tell you what are the requirements for moisture, like dry, wet, or medium soil, or for sun exposure, shade, and partial shade, full sun. Um, and some are very easy. They just kept ex expanding. They self-seed, and they come up all over the garden. Now I say, what am I going to do with all this penstemon that's growing in the middle of the prunella? <laughs> <laughs> but then there are others that are more difficult, like uh, because they are... Um, in fact, I just lost uh, Baptisia, Baptisia tintoria. It's a little shrubby plant. It's a host plant to one of the butterflies. So I'm really sad to have lost it, but I couldn't find and you know I couldn't find it when we went to clean up oh, the garden. So That's another thing back. I would like to mention about the cleaning up. Mm. Um, we shouldn't just just not do garden clean up in the fall. Uh, we should leave the leaves and leave the stems because those are habitat, wintering habitat for the bees. Um, mm. You know, that is where they, they just spend, they need to be insulated under the layer of leaves. And then some, uh, some of the uh, bees nest in those stems. So don't uh, be, you know, uh, in a rush to clean your garden. Just leave it standing for the winter. The birds would continue eating the seeds that are left on the stalks. And then in the springtime, I, we had to do some cleanup because some of those long stalks were completely flat, uh -huh. you know, on on the ground. And but we so we cut we cut them, but don't cut them all the way to the ground. Leave maybe eighteen inches uh, standing, so the sorry, so uh -huh. that um, the bees can use them for nesting. So we okay. we we have two, uh, like a front yard that we keep fairly manicured right but we didn't pick up our leaves we didn't pick up the leaves along the wall and and on the Good. the plantings and so there's a rotary group that i ran into just about two months ago and they said no mow in may 
well, if I didn't mow in May, we would not be able to recognize our, <laughs> our house. In the back, it's like a blank canvas. There's no chemicals. There's nothing back there. Yes. But we also left leaves in dirt mm -hmm. in certain piles mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. took the grass out in a certain area. I know you'll be happy about that. And then all along Niv's fence and, and things like that where the leaves did. Con yes. So I've been looking at thinking, oh, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have. We should have raked the leaves. But now I'm thinking this is not a mistake. This is really good. Yes. Yes. And the, you know, the normal May, I've heard conflicting uh, information about that. Um, they say the better message is reduce your lawn. <laughs> not, just, not just, you know. Well, if you don't, don't like cut, to mow, then don't you're just, not Don't just cut your lawn, but reduce it. Yeah, because you don't mow, unless you have native plants in your lawn, um, all you're doing is you're letting the, the bad weeds uh, go to seed, and then you'll have more bad weeds. Lots and, of it. and then your neighbor, oh. who's obsessed about the weeds, is going to put even more poison on the lawn to kill the weeds. So it becomes a, a the wrong, you know, chain of events. Right, a vicious <coughs> cycle of mm -hmm. not not good endings. So the better idea is reduce your lawn. The other <laughs> thing that impressed me about your your presentation the other night was how you've engaged the community. Yes, and I, and I'm really surprised about that, but. It seems that every time I needed help, like putting up the fences, preparing the ground, people were just fighting each other to come and help. Mm -hmm. Or they would come and bring a friend, bring a spouse. You know, the people I did not know, complete strangers, they offered <laughs> to help, and they came and brought friends. So um, tonight I'm going to do some work there with a couple of volunteers. That we have wood chips to spread on, on the path in the new garden that a Boy Scout built for us. Um, for an ego project, and mm. you know, people are coming to help. So sometimes I'm doing work by myself. In a way, it's easier if I have an hour, I can just go and do it. Some weeding or planting. If it seems easier sometimes to organize with other people to have find the time that we are all. It's difficult. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. difficult to to schedule it. So, but then sometimes people will say, "Oh, I'm available." You know, such and such a day, and usually I'm flexible, so I can match with their availability. So And children, you've been inviting all the children yes. down? Yes. <laughs> Start them young. Start I think them. that's good. Good yes, habits. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. very, it's so rewarding. The second graders from the Bayam School, which is walk, within walking distance to the farm, they, they've they been coming on a field trip in the spring. And um, this this week was the third time, the third year that they... They have come and, I mean, they look at other sections of the farm, but they also come to the Polynesian Garden. And they already know a lot about, you know, the butterflies and the host plants. And, uh, and I tell them about the needs of the bees and the plants that we are putting there. And I told them, you know, bring, bring the people you love. Bring them here. Mm -hmm. Tell them what you learned and show them the plants. And, and <laughs> they said, yes, yes, I will come back. <laughs> and they pointed out some little child was walking with her family, and she said, look, I planted that plant. Yes. Yeah, oh, and how proud. You, you give them a chance to plant. Yes, love that. yes, yes. Some of the plants I had grown. I, I prepared the, the beds. I made the, the holes, you know, for the plants. All they had to do is turn the pot over, take the plant out, and... That's what I, I like. Plug it in the ground. <laughs> yeah, so Gardening made easy. It's <laughs> nice to make connections and teach the young, you know, young people to care for the earth. And they'll never forget that, you know, so that's yeah. really good to start them so young. Yeah. We yeah. have a tree in our yard that was planted by Dennis Stott when he was a, a kid, maybe a oh, Cub yeah. Scout, this beautiful beech tree. It's ginormous. Uh, I need mm. somebody to come in and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, professionally uh, trim it, but... But that's his tree. In my mind, that's his tree. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> that was really nice. Um, so, Giancarla, did you say you were a teacher? Is that where you were you a teacher well, here locally? What happened? Yeah, I was, but only for a short time uh -huh. because. Um, okay, let's go back. How much time do you have to hear my life history? Uh, you know, I, I'm not an American born. You can tell. <laughs> Beautiful accent. <laughs> I came from Italy as um, a young bride. I was only 22 years old. Oh. This year is our 50th wedding oh, anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. Yes, 50, you. that's wonderful. So we had, you know, two boys right away, and then a few years later we had the girls. So I stayed home for all that time. And I had my um, college degree from, uh, from Italy, and um, I put that aside. 
I, I had a, a math degree, and uh, but to teach here, I needed to uh, to be licensed in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. So what I, when I decided to work, first I started as a teacher aide in the classroom, um, and then the the principal offered me the chance to to earn uh, the teaching you know license, and I did that. So I did uh, teach math and science for just a few years, and then yes. I said, okay, I want to have fun and do my... <laughs> <laughs> do your garden. Your passion do the, project. Do the things I love, <laughs> I love yes. that. Yes. And are your children gardeners at all? Uh, I don't think so, no. they And unfortunately, they don't live nearby, so... You can't um, take over yeah, their land, is they, what it is. <laughs> <laughs> they're, so, they're far away, so. Huh. So, Mary, w when we look at properties, you know, prospective properties, mm -hmm. we're we're always kind of assessing, um, you know, the demands of the property on what our clients would be and things like that. And we often get people who are moving into their first home and know nothing about. Yeah. Well, I moved into a new home a couple of years ago, and I still feel like I know nothing. It was not my first home, but yeah. I'm just not a gardener. It's not something that um, I've made time for, I think, more than anything else. But I like the idea of it, and, mm -hmm. you know, it is something I've been thinking about what I want to do landscape-wise in my house. I live in Nashua now, but... Um, but I'm sure there's similar, you know, species and things mm -hmm. that I should be looking at, and I hadn't that hadn't occurred to me until we had you on today. So well, the I'm, problem with with the, what we the regular plants that people that we've been putting in our gardens around the house, those are not native plants. Mm -hmm. You know, the plant industry has been selling plants brought from other continents, mm -hmm. and and or or those cultivars that they have manipulated. You know, to create maybe a different color, right, a double or, flower, different height. Right. Um, so, and, and people don't re don't know that concept. That, you know, you may have had it in your yard for fifty years, but it's still not a native plant. Mm -hmm. You know, a and it's not helping the ecosystem. It's not helping the bees, the butterflies, the birds. So, uh, we really we need to turn around and and look to put plants that are native. They're, they are beautiful. They're just a little bit more wild looking sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but they're beautiful, and, and it is even more beautiful when they're full of of the bees and the butterflies right. that we're trying to help. And then the birds come to eat, and, you know, so... Well, you say that ecosystem, and, and I immediately think rainforest. Like, that's somewhere else in the world. Mm. That's not my own backyard. Mm -hmm. So I'm, It is in our own backyard. Yeah. In fact, if you have uh, read or, or, or heard um, Dr. Talamy... Uh, he um, is writing about uh, like create not don't uh, just look at the national parks as a place for nature to be, but look at uh, they, he calls it a homegrown national park oh, oh, like where, that. where we plant you know right plant where the, you live the oak trees and yes yeah. plant like trees that, like the oaks that um, provide caterpillars. For, for the birds, like a chickadees needs thousands of caterpillars to feed to their young ones. So yes. if we don't have the caterpillars, then the... the right, then the chickadees disappear. Yes. So create your own homegrown national park. Oh, I love that. Yes. I noticed that the water table is very high around here, right? So where, where I lived all my life down in D.C. and in Virginia, water tables were not high at all. But mm -hmm. here they're very high. Lots of swamps, not so far away. Yeah, wet, wetlands. Yeah. wetlands. So we have a wet area, a, a very wet area down at the bottom of our yard. That's where the grass is the most beautiful, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and the hardest to mow because it's very thick and it's often too wet to squishy. mow. It's squishy. <laughs> <laughs> so I noticed on your list uh, something called willow, mule willow. Is that really a willow tree? Well, there is, um, there is pussy. There are many different kinds of native willows. The pussy willow is a, is a common one, but there are prairie willows and, you know, different kinds. I um, think of the one, the big droopy ones, you know, that like oh, wet tree. areas. Yes, they like wet areas. So you could plant willows down there. Yes. yes. And the willows, the good thing with willows is that they're um, the first plants to bloom in March or, oh. or you know, or whenever. Whenever. Like, whenever spring happens <laughs> in the winter next year. Depending on the weather, <laughs> yeah, yes. Exactly. But the willows are the first source of pollen and nectar that the, that the bees oh. coming out of hibernation will, ah. will find. 
And, and so it's very important. Willows, talking about the game, boys and girls, willows have a characteristic that the male flowers are all on one plant and the female flowers are all on the other plant. So, oh. so you want um, two? Like well, if you, well, you want two if you want seeds, but if you, the, the male plant has a pollen, which is very, very important. So if you, if you have to choose, better to have a male um, willow. And how do you tell that when you go to well, the, they're, someone they're, else knows? They're, they're not, <laughs> you can't look well, under branches right, right, or anything, right? right? I, I, learned, I learned how to identify okay. that. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> we can, I'm not going to make jokes about that. But um, when, <laughs> when the flower blooms, you, you know, when you have the flower, you I, I bought, um, somebody recommended a jeweler's loop. It's a magnifying lens. Oh, yeah. So when you look at the flower, you're actually seeing the female, because the female part is going to make the seed, it has a different shape. Oh, okay. It, it, may, it may be like a roundness, you know. Like, wow. Yeah. So we're going to, you know, I have to shade all those golf balls. They've been coming. They've been, something has happened so that whatever was protecting our solar panels from the golf balls is no longer there. Oh. So something has come, something has come down on the golf course, right? Right at that ninth hole. Yeah. And so, so we are getting dings all the time, which of course ruins the damaging, the, damaging the, and, and mm-hmm. the golf course does replace them. Does really? Re- yes. But I was thinking down there it would be wonderful to put, you know, something that would shield or at least stop catch, the balls. Ca- catch the yeah. <laughs> yes. So I was thinking of so, a couple of willows. Yeah, so put the will. You can put the yeah. row of willows. Yeah, down row there. of willows. Yeah. So they're, they're kind of a hurting. Lot of male <laughs> ones. <laughs> Bam. Well, you have room for some girls too. Okay. We have room for girls. Yeah. So, so we'll be we'll be talking to you about willow trees. <laughs> I recently read a book called This Hidden Life of Trees, mm. which was just magnificent. So when you talk about plants, this is this is the science of trees. Mm. Yes. And um, when I, I was sick two years ago, they recommended something called forest bathing. Yes. Well, forest bathing is just sitting and being among the trees and that there is the energy and whatever mm. they release. Mm. Relaxing. That is relaxing and oh. calming. And have you do you do you feel that way around the plants that you're around, or? Well, there is such a thing as uh, meadow bathing. Oh. In fact, that is a concept that I promoted when I um, made the proposal to put the meadow at the new farm that the Coolest. Town, at the coolest farm that yes. the town purchased last oh, year. Yeah. So I'm I'm pushing for to have one or two acres. I don't know how much they will end up. Giving me, I mean, giving it's not giving them to me, but putting you in charge of, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so you would be able to do the same, walking among the, you know, the the wildflowers, the native flowers, and but for me, yes, for me, it's almost a religious experience mm-hmm. when I'm, I see the flowers and and the bees and the butterflies. I say thank you, thank you. Um, I say a prayer of thanksgiving. Yes. Um, or if I find, you know, the the bluebirds have hatched, or the bluebirds have fledged. I said, yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Well, it is a spiritual experience. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it has been so wonderful talking to you, but I wonder if you'll tell Mary a little story oh. that you told me last night about uh, Jane Seeker, Jane Newhouse. Yes. Um, who was I, on our show. Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, Jane. You, you, sent me, you sent me a couple of uh, shows to, to watch just to get familiar with the, the setting. And um, and so she had said, if you find uh, an, an abandoned animal, your first concern is not to feed it. The first concern is that the animal is cold because something happened to the mother mm-hmm. and um, the, the, either the bird or, you know, whatever animal it is, cannot is not able to eat if it is just cold. Yep. So um, it was a it's a sad story. At, at your neighbor's house, I knew there were the babies, there were bluebird babies. I did not know how many because, you know, I had seen that there were st- still some egg. Well, the first time I saw the hatching, I didn't count them. You know, I just saw that. So I recorded that they hatched. Then the following time, I was going to count them. But when I put my hand over the nest, I f- it was icy cold. Mm. So I knew that. Something happened to the mother. This is early in the morning, so something happened to the mother. I don't know if it was a cat that killed the mother. Mm-hmm. That is another thing, you know, keep mm-hmm. your cats indoors. Um, or a hawk or, or some other predator that mm-hmm. the mother was not um, 
was not there for the night, you know, to keep the young ones warm. And so I said, okay, they, they're dead. Okay, I took them out, but as I put them in my hands, I and I started breathing on them, like to to warm them warm up them with up. with my <laughs> exhale. <laughs> And uh, and I felt some movement. Oh. So I said, I had just heard, watched that video from Jane who said, oh. don't try to feed them, just put them on a heating pad and uh, and they will it will revive them and the, and they did so oh wow <laughs> that's wonderful and then she did something after that she uh. brought them home and she was going to deliver them to Wayland but something else intervened well the thing is that um it could be a long drive and uh, you know i was afraid if if i tried first of all i would have had to get in touch with the rehabilitator that i know and that would have been time lost in the meantime and then driving there, um, they were going to get cold again. Right. So, so then I thought, what can I do? I had um, I had another birdhouse where there was only, I knew there was only one egg that had hatched. So I declared that a, <laughs> a foster home. <laughs> 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 so, but I, I really would like to find maybe Jane knows somebody. Um, a, a bird rehabilitator that is closer to Ben Wayland, yeah. yeah. Ben Wayland, because yeah. uh, unfortunately it happened again today. Oh. And do you know this time the mother was dead on the nest? Oh, no. Oh, no. So, and they were, you know, the babies again were cold. So, yeah, it keeps happening. So I, I need to, I need to find the rehabilitator closer. Well, hopefully she's going to go to Coolis. Hopefully she'll get her center. But she's not doing birds. No, she doesn't do birds. No, no she doesn't do birds. She said that. Nor big animals is what she yeah, said. Yeah, it, it different skills, different, different um, mm-hmm. yeah, you different know, worlds, yeah. c- cages or whatever treatment you need to do for the different animals. Well, I thank you so much. And, yeah. and Mary, another message that came from this very wise person the other night was, Think globally, but act locally. Uh, yeah, okay. that, that is what I keep in mind. Yeah. I want to definitely build my own national park in my yard. <laughs> Let's do <laughs> I'm it. very inspired Let's by that. Let's do it. Thank you, Giancola. We have a consultant. Thank you, yes. Giancola, oh, so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. All it's right. a privilege. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. you. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Talking about home.